How do we know God is all good and not all evil? This is the challenge that has been raised by Stephen Law, and it's called the Evil God Challenge. Through the cumulative case of various arguments in natural theology, theistic philosophers identify God as a maximally great being, which is to say he has all the properties that are ontologically beneficial to their maximal extent. We've demonstrated in previous videos, omniscience and omnipotence are logically coherent, but how do we know God is maximally good and not maximally evil? This is Stephen Law's evil God challenge, as he puts it, The challenge is to explain why the hypothesis that there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, and all-good God should be considered significantly more reasonable than the hypothesis that there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, and all-evil God. Imagine that God is maximally evil. His depravity is without limit. His cruelty knows no bounds. There is no other God or gods, just this supremely wicked being. Call this the evil God hypothesis. Notice this is not an attack on the argument that God exists. Instead, it is a philosophical argument that attempts to show that even if God exists, based on a posteriori arguments, then we can't know whether such a God is maximally good or maximally evil. Well, although it is true from arguments, like the cosmological or teleological argument, that we can't know if that implies a maximally good or maximally evil God, the basic ontology itself of a maximally evil God can be shown to be logically incoherent. First, good and evil can be seen epistemically as opposites, but in a metaphysical sense, evil is simply a lack of or privation of good. Remember, evil is not a thing. Evil is when a conscious being corrupts something that exists in its natural, good state. It is an intentional act of the will to misuse something, not as it was intended to be used. For example, A knife is not evil in and of itself. What is evil is when a person uses it to intentionally harm someone. Language is not evil. What is evil is when a person misuses language to lie for a selfish gain. John Melbank puts it like this. Evil as privation is not purely and simply nothing. As substance, it may be nothing, but in its effect of removal and deficiency, it engenders a distorted positive act even though, as positive, that act is not distorted. Some have argued evil cannot be a privation of good from a thought experiment. Picture a scenario where you cause harm to me, and a scenario where you have no interaction with me at all. If evil is the lack of good, then both of these situations should be seen as the same, since in both scenarios, there is a complete lack of good. However, intuitively, we know it is better to have no interaction than a situation where one causes harm. So how can evil be a lack of good if in both situations there is a lack of good, but one is intuitively better than the other? The problem with this thought experiment is it assumes good has to be an action performed. The reality is things are good in and of themselves, and evil is simply when a being corrupts or misuses something wrongly. In the second scenario, having no interaction with me does not corrupt or misuse me in any way. Leaving things as they are is still good. If we came across a garden, it would still be good by itself, even if we never interacted with it. It would still be good if we decided to tend to it, and it would still be good if we decided to destroy it. What would be evil in this scenario is the act of destroying something that did not belong to us, or destroying someone else's work. It can also be worded as, evil happens when one is deprived of goods, intrinsic or instrumental. So evil seems to be a privation of good, or in other words, when a conscious being corrupts something that exists in its natural, good state. So back to the evil God challenge. The answer simply is that it is impossible to be maximally evil. For evil to exist, there has to be something good for an evil being to corrupt. In reality, evil is simply a bad or selfish intention of the will in order to obtain something good, something like power, pleasure, or safety. However, these things by themselves are not evil in and of themselves. It is only when someone misuses or corrupts them do they become evil. Bad cannot be bad just for the sake of being bad. One can only be bad for the sake of obtaining what is already good. So in reality, there is no such thing as maximal evil. 
there is only corrupted good. No matter how evil you might become, you will always be doing it in pursuit of things which are good. So there must be some base goodness for any being to be evil, and therefore, no way to be maximally evil, only corrupted good. As C.S. Lewis said, If dualism is true, then the bad power must be a being who likes badness for its own sake. But in reality, we have no experience of anyone liking badness just because it is bad. The nearest we can get to it is in cruelty. But in real life, people are cruel for one of two reasons. Either because they are sadists, that is because they have a sexual perversion, which makes cruelty a cause of sensual pleasure to them, or else for the sake of something they are going to get out of it, money or power or safety. But pleasure, money, power, and safety are all, as far as they go, good things. The badness consists in pursuing them by the wrong method, or in the wrong way, or too much. I do not mean, of course, that the people who do this are not desperately wicked. I do mean that wickedness, when you examine it, turns out to be the pursuit of some good in the wrong way. You can be good for the mere sake of goodness. You cannot be bad for the mere sake of badness. You can do a kind action when you are not feeling kind and when it gives you no pleasure, simply because kindness is right. But no one ever did a cruel action simply because cruelty is wrong. Only because cruelty was pleasant or useful to him. In other words, badness cannot succeed even in being bad in the same way in which goodness is good. Goodness is, so to speak, itself. Badness is only spoiled goodness, and there must be something good first before it can be spoiled. Thus, there is no such thing as maximal evil, only corrupted or incomplete good beings. So logically speaking, there can be no such thing as maximal evil, and no maximally evil being, and therefore evil is contingent on good. Now some might still reject this idea of evil as a privation of good, but we can still make the argument another way using similar logic. Let's remember that a maximally great evil being has to be maximal in all its properties, which includes the properties of evil. So an evil god would be maximally unjust, cruel, sadistic, selfish, and in other similar ways. Now let's focus on maximal selfishness. Here is how this argument I found runs. Premise 1. Any maximally great being in any possible world would need to have all their characteristics to the logical maximum. An evil maximally great being in any possible world would have selfishness to its maximal extent. An evil maximally great being in any possible world would not be willing to share anything at all, being maximally selfish and completely self-absorbed. An evil maximally great being in any possible world would be capable of not creating anything else. An evil maximally great being in any possible world would not have the will to create anything due to its supreme selfishness. An evil maximally great being in any possible world would not create anything. But see, this contradicts the very reality of our existence. We exist and a whole universe does. In fact, one could even argue a maximally selfish being could not even consider creating another being to share existence with or even devote thoughts to the possibility of other beings. So therefore we reach something other than an evil god exists. Conclusion, therefore an evil god cannot logically exist. The very definition of a maximally great evil being cannot even be sustained. But what if one objects that a maximally evil being could create some creatures in order to be even more evil? In other words, it would be more evil to create and allow creatures to experience good in order to rip it away from them. But logically, this would still be inconsistent with his selfishness. Such an evil being could never give anything else to another creature, since he would have to be maximally selfish in all possible ways. Now perhaps one could argue that an evil god has to lack maximal selfishness in order to maximize evil in terms of causing torture and suffering. But if an evil god has to require other beings in order to maximize his evilness, then such a being's properties are contingent on their being creatures, and therefore such a being cannot be necessary, and therefore cannot be maximally great. 
This would make such a being incompatible with contingency and ontological arguments, and therefore not more reasonable than the hypothesis there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect being. Remember, a maximally great being is one whose existence and properties are contingent on nothing. If the very properties of an evil maximally great being means he is contingent on other beings, then this hypothesis cannot be a competing hypothesis with the maximally great being of natural theology. Furthermore, natural theology contains the moral argument, which specifically argues from moral realism to a necessary personal source for the good. So it logically follows from a posteriori arguments, a maximally great being would have to be the good and therefore would be morally perfect, and not maximally evil. Now Stephen Law is aware of this fact, but his only objection is to raise the Euthyphro dilemma, which we've addressed elsewhere. Now perhaps one could say this challenge only is meant to address the teleological and cosmological arguments, but natural theology doesn't work by individual unconnected arguments, but together as a cumulative case, arguing for one maximally great being from different angles. If the cosmological argument posits a necessary being, the ontological argument posits a maximally great being, and the moral argument posits a necessary and personal source, then it is far more parsimonious to say we are simply talking about one maximally great being, instead of three different beings. It is just a logical conclusion when Occam's razor is invoked. So even if Law could demonstrate that a maximally great evil being was logically possible, the hypothesis would still not be more reasonable than the maximally great being given to us by the various arguments of natural theology, because of the implications of the moral argument. However, as we have demonstrated, the concept of a maximally great evil being doesn't even seem to be logically coherent, and therefore cannot adequately compete with the hypothesis of an all-good, maximally great being. <laughs>